We are live. Hello, everybody, everyone in Australia, in the US, beyond. I know we have such an amazing community here now. Um, and I'm absolutely buzzing. I don't know if anyone can tell that we have Greg Santucci here. Oh, the man of the, the hour, the man of the year. I don't know. I've been following your stuff for a while, a long while, and spreading it out to everyone I know. Um, and I'm just so uh, grateful for you giving us your time coming on. And we have a lot to chat about, um, well, tonight for your time or this morning for my time. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think... Um, well, today we are talking about changing the focus from our kids' behavior to their brain. Um, and what does that look like in real life? Because we know um, there are a lot of memes, there's a lot of articles, there's a lot of podcasts about this paradigm shift from looking at our child's behavior, this whole behavioral mindset, to a more brain-based, compassionate approach to supporting kids, right? So we, we're kind of going to talk about what does that actually look like? We're going to talk about some real life examples. I've got some stories. Greg has some stories. Um, we're going to sort of help um, share these so that the we share the power and the sensory, support the sensory preferences and seeing behavior in a new lens, which we know is so powerful for kids when we change the way we show up and we change the way we are seeing their behavior and, and them as little people, then, um, then, then big huge changes happen. So this is what Greg and I are going to talk about. And um, uh, he's, he's an, I, I think I did type hopefully correctly, OT extraordinaire <laughs> from the US. Um, he's the founding director of Power Play Pediatric Therapy over in New Jersey. I have never been, but it's on my bucket list. So I will come over and say hi when we, when we can get out of here. <laughs> um, I live in the and we're about 40 minutes from New York City. Oh, so come on over. Yes, ah, it sounds beautiful. Um, and Greg has been in clinical practice for over 20 years, and he's currently a supervisor of occupational therapy at Children's Specialized Hospital. He's certified in sensory integration, um, and the, he's the creator of the Model of Child Engagement, a developmentally informed treatment model that focuses on felt safety and regulation to support children during play and just daily occupations, daily interactions. So he's also married to another OT. So you're, you're a double OT family. <laughs> and you've got two teenage kids um, and you learn from them every day. It also explains my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Where that went. <laughs> um, so as we start, I, I want to let everyone know, if you are watching live, please let us know where you're watching from on Facebook here. We're streaming live into Let's Raise Emotionally Intelligent Kids group. But if you're watching a little bit later or if you're watching on YouTube, also put down a comment and say hi, um, ask your questions. I always like to go back and check through and have little conversations and, and open up the, um, the dialogue with people. So please feel free to do that. I've got my live up here as well. So I'm watching along um, with you guys. Uh, so I want to tell a quick story, Greg, and I want to get your opinion on it because I feel okay. literally when it happened, I was like, I wonder what Greg would say about this. <laughs> <laughs> so we were, um, we were coming home from school one day. This is only a few weeks ago. And okay. my son is, um, he's almost eight. So he's in year two. And he said, mom, I've got a sore back. And I was, I was driving. So I was kind of looking at it. I was like, why? You got a sore back. What's up? You know, did you hurt it playing soccer or something? He said, no, we had to, if we wanted double dojo points, we had to sit really straight, be very quiet and still. And the straighter we sat up, that meant we would get um, an extra dojo point on our dojo. For everyone who doesn't know that there's a lot of, I've spoken to so many Australian parents and they have the dojo system. And I think you guys do over in the US, right? Yeah, you're already laughing. <laughs> and I was like, you, you triggered me. We're, we're, we're in... <laughs> go ahead. Oh, yeah. I have to adore your son now. But go ahead. Yeah, he, he, he said, you know, he really wanted a point. He did get the extra point. Um, mm -hmm. I tried to, I, I tried to think very quickly. I was like, how much of a deep conversation can I get into with you about the, like my son, about the points and the rewards and the, you know, 
oh, the sitting up straight and things like that. And, um, and anyway, so I, I, I did have a little conversation with him about um, how many points he has, which he was proud to tell me. And then he said, but I know so-and-so, a beautiful little girl um, has this many points, like a hundred and something points. And then, and I said, what about the kids who, like, do you know the kids who have not as many points? Like they don't, they have the lower kind of points. He goes, oh yeah. And he rattled off about three or four names yeah. Yeah. Um, and was kind of saying more or less they're, you know, they're the kids who are silly or naughty or doing the wrong thing. And, and, and I, in my head, I was like, no, like, oh man, you know, so much wrong with this system. And I tried to have a little discussion with him about, you know, why, why do we have these points? Why do you teach, why does your teacher need to give you points to do the right thing? Don't you just, you want to do that anyway. And, you know, if you can, you will. So, and if the kids who aren't doing it, then something's getting in the way and they need our help as well, rather than just trying to give them points. Right. Anyway, I gave up because he was seven. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and why, why is sitting up straight a measure of anything anyway. I'm I'm sitting in a chair that moves because this time of night, sitting up straight is realistic. To, no points for us. Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. We're we're hanging with the the bad kids who don't have any points, right? Because posturally, you know, it's it's hard to sit up straight. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece of that is, well, if I'm focusing all of my energy on sitting up straight, what am I missing? Because I'm thinking about here i'm gonna be missing some content because i'm focused on sit there's and then obviously he's got the one girl who's got the bazillion points who's gonna win the trip to hawaii and, and you know that that's the teacher's pet right <laughs> because the teacher loves her because she gets all the points and then yeah you got the bad kids and their reputation is already defined by these points um and your your son's a, a good boy so this this behavior system he doesn't necessarily need it it, it, it doesn't necessarily have value for him because he's a good kid and the kids who are having a hard time well they can't win in that system yeah it's disappointing um, so here we are so congratulations to him <laughs> on getting that point i know and i was I, like and, and oh, i hope what? he realized that it really wasn't worth it <laughs> oh i know yeah and they do have the at the end of the week you know you can get a little tiny two dollar one dollar toy and and he was he was excited about that and i was like oh no you know so much we're missing. Until he loses it. And then, and then it's gone or it breaks. And and then there's that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that momentary, hey, I got the thing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if the kid has a bad a bad Monday or a bad Tuesday and early in the week, well, they're, they're done for the week. They're not going to be able to get to Friday. So they're, they're shut down by Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'll say this, the most important part of all of this and why we have to change it. And, I, and I'm saying this to the teachers and to the people who, uh, who employ these, these tokens and trinkets and prizes and, and all that stuff. When you stop doing that, think of the money you'll see yeah. from all of the tchotchke stuff that you got to buy to to get these little prizes that are just nothing like you're gonna save money because mm. that's the one thing we all do we all don't have we all don't have money well don't spend the money on the toys um so all of the, uh, what we're talking about um in terms of the, this different approach is completely free mm. it, it, is, it is just it is a resource that you have your 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 empathy is free. Your compassion is free. Your relationship is free. You don't need the thing. Um, so, you know, hey, the, the economy is tough. So you're welcome. Just yeah. save us some money. <laughs> if that's one thing you take away from this um, conversation, <laughs> at least that. And, and I love how, you know, when we you, we were sort of talking about the interview and deciding on the title and, and it's that shift of the focus from looking at our child and what they're doing and if that measures up to us and if it pleases us or not shifting away from that and looking at what's going on in their brain and their nervous system, which is driving how they act and how they behave and the decisions they make. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I was, when I was thinking about it um, and what we wanted to talk about it, I wanted to do something new and, 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 and really get some information out there. And then I'm thinking about parents and, 
especially over the past couple of years, just how hard parenting has been over the past couple of years. And I'll take it to another level that parents now, myself included, my parents in that generation, we went from cassette tapes to CDs. That was the big technological jump. We went from like dry erase marker boards to a computer that was really slow. This generation of parents went from CDs to full 24 hour access to the internet. It's really hard to be a parent right now. We're fighting technology, we're fighting iPads, you know, trying to keep track of where our kid, we can keep track of our kids online. Um, we have doorbells now that act as phones. Uh, like, like, it's really hard to be a parent right now. So in thinking about this and, 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 and being a parent myself, it's like, wow, okay, I, I need those strategies so that I have a plan and that I have a model so that when I'm in this emotional state and I'm doing the best that I can with the tools that I have, if I have this tool, can I get over the hump and approach a situation not reactive, but with this plan, with this model, with this trick? Mm -hmm. total game changer because all you need is one or two successes and then you got it yeah powerful <laughs> mm. so let's talk a little bit about i know you have um you have a story that you're going to share with us or you know uh, um, an anecdote about you know when we are in the grocery store or our kids want want something from us um and we you know a lot of parents will see the right. persistent behavior of, you know, can I have it? I want this, please. Uh, you know, we have to say no. Sometimes we have to say no. We can't get it right. today or, or we don't we don't want to or, you know, we don't have time, things like that. Right. Um, talk a little bit about that for us. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll say um, like two different versions of this story. And this, first of all, has happened to me multiple times. In, in my life. And, and I'm sure that the majority of, of people watching this is this has happened. I, I don't know of a kid ever who has not begged or asked for something in a store or any vending machine ever. Mm -hmm. It's like there's this glow yeah. around these vending machines that whatever is on the other side of the glass, I need it. And if I can get in there, that's even better. <laughs> so, uh. so in thinking about this, and, and you know, we've all been a, a, at whatever store you're at, and you got the drop down, melt down, pick up an aisle four, there's your kid sprawled out, um, because they want something and they can't get it. So we have to react, and we react a different way. So if a parent's embarrassed or, or triggered, they're going to snap back at that kid, dysregulated adult, dysregulated kid, never ends well. But stepping back in this new paradigm shift, what's actually happening there? The child has no power whatsoever. They want something and they have no power. You hold, literally you hold the purse. You hold the purse strings, you have the money. So that in reflecting back on this more compassionate way and, and thinking like a kid, why is the child upset? It's because they have no power. So, okay, so how do we change this? We give them access to money and this from and I, I'm going to explain this from how I did it with my own kids to how I do it with the, the kids on my caseload um, who have a ver are either autistic or ADHD or have, a, a, you know, whatever developmental disability, um, because it works universally. So what I had done from, from a very early stage in my kid's life is I gave them access to money. Not a lot. Um, again, we're, we're all strapped for cash, so it wasn't a lot. But by giving them money, that completely changed the dialogue. So now when we were going to the store, it was, don't forget your money. <laughs> okay, so now, now they're, it, it, and you can feel it already, but we're completely refocused. And again, maybe it's a buck when they're really, really little, nothing big, but they get to spend their money. They have power. So the drop down stuff, it, it all of a sudden, you're going to have less of a chance of that happening because you've refocused it. So I'm sharing power with them. Did it undermine me in any way? No, not at all. Um, so they find something. Now, if it's too 
big if they want the $20 doll. That's a conversation to have. But again, they have their money and they don't have enough. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But if they see something, a candy, a little trinket toy, they can get it. Yeah. Okay. So game changer. So the other piece of that is say it's $2 and they only have one. In the beginning, I was like, okay, I, I got you this time. Or I, we used to say, daddy pays the tax. <laughs> so if it was $2, but there was tax, I, I don't worry, I get the tax. Um, but it, it changed it changed the dynamic. It gave them a little bit of power. Yeah. As they got older and they saw the $5 toy that they wanted and they only had $2, well, that's a conversation. So, because they would ask me, well, how do I get more money? Well, we can talk about that. There's a lot of things that you can do to help me around the house and I would really appreciate it. And so I never went into like, chores and allow it like it was oh it started with access to money and then it was this this partnership and so everybody's helping everybody else out um and so that always worked and that from that day on it stopped the drop down meltdown because what's actually happening is they don't have any power and a lot of times especially when you have kids who have emotional, regula emotional regulation issues, which is most young children, <laughs> that giving them that access to power, sharing power with them will prevent mm -hmm. the drop-down, meltdown um, issues that happen in the grocery stores or in front of the vending machines. So I'll switch that to a boy that I was working with who was older, non-speaking, autistic, got extremely aggressive anytime he was in front of a vending machine. So mm -hmm. if mom said no, he would punch her. Mm -hmm. And and like, that's not okay, that can't happen. My first question was, does he have access to money? And she said, no, she gave him access to money. Again, a couple of dollars. He was able to, when there was a vending machine there, he had his little, his little purse that he carried around with him. He had his money. And he was able to get something. The behaviors went from him punching her every time to it never happening again. So we went from all the time to none of the time. And yeah. from there, it was focus on giving them power. Um, so, so those, like, it, again, it works for, for neurotypical kids, neurodivergent kids. Um, mm -hmm. But always step back and be like, well, you know, what's, what's my child telling me? Yes. And it's, they, they don't have any power. So give them some power. You're not giving up complete control. Again, by by me doing this, I wasn't undermined as a parent. I wasn't giving away the candy store or just letting the kid run all over the place. I, I gave them some power and I set up a partnership with them that led me down a path for their entire childhood of a collaborative back and forth of you, you need money. I need help. Hey. Perfect. Let's go. Uh, so that's my first story. That happened to me so many times, but it, it's really interesting because I've seen like charts where you get two dollars if you you take the garbage out, three dollars. There's style points within all of this, mm -hmm. and and like that's it. It's I'm not saying you have to do it this way. Everybody has their own little style, but that the idea of sharing power is the take home message and will prevent the meltdown because that's why they're dropping to the floor in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, I just love how you explain it so clearly and so easily. And yet, like, you know, it's, it's compassionately because even though our child is much younger than us, much smaller than us, and their brain isn't as developed. And so, you know, it doesn't matter. We don't need to have this massive hierarchy of, well, I'm up here and I'm, you're down there and I say the rules and you listen to me and I'm like, you're wrong. Da, 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 da. Like that, that just in, you know, it, it creates those conflicts and those clashes. And it's that old style, right? It's that old paradigm of, of that old lens of viewing our child's behavior that they're doing it on purpose and they're doing it to push my buttons and they're choosing to act like this. Yeah. Right. right. No, no, they really need you. And, and yes, you have the power, your mom and your dad and you are everything to them. You have it already. Share a little bit. You'll be okay. <laughs> You're still mom or dad and they're everything. You'll be fine. 
<laughs> they're not going to turn into this delinquent. They'll still get their dojo points in school. Oh, I was going to say, yeah. I got that go full circle there. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, okay. Yeah, I think that's a. I think that's a big thing for parents is that if I do allow them a little choice and control or money or or if I negotiate and work with them, doesn't that mean I am losing my power as the parent or I'm I'm that's undermining my authority? And it's not. No. You're, you're getting off the adversarial unilateral. Right. We were just talking about Ross Green before we jumped on the live and it's getting out of that, um, right. that whole mentality and into a collaborative. Let's work together. You, you know, I have something you need. You can help me. It, it's in a, it's a partnership, like you said. Right. It's just a partnership. Right. And you know what? The, I think the thing that drives me nuts and, and through my own parenting journey, you know, I had to hold the line and, and stay true to my beliefs when I had a lot of naysayers um, all around me. The generation before on, on both sides of, of my family were like, you're kidding, right? And I just held the line. They've since apologized. Um, <laughs> so, and, and they follow on social media. <laughs> but like, because, like you just, you have to stay true to your beliefs um, that you're not losing control. I think the thing that drives me nuts is there's no permissiveness in this at all. I, I, I run a pretty tight ship. I'm very deliberate. I, I have this model in my head and I always go back to that model in my head as to what I'm trying to accomplish. And I stay true to that. I think what drives me nuts is the parents who are like really authoritarian. And then they're just like, whatever, I give up. And it becomes completely permissive. Mm. I think that's when we get into a lot of, a lot of trouble. That if you do the, the partnership and you stay true to these beliefs as opposed to, I have to lay down the law until it doesn't work and then I just give up. Well, what message is that sending? Yeah. Um, th then you're creating fear and, and you know, kids, it's just, it's just messy. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's easier. I've become more chill over the years. There's been fewer crises. There's been a lot of crises and drama. I just handle them differently. <laughs> <laughs> so I come, I come at it from a state of regulation. Um, mm, that's and why I also I, lose my cool sometimes. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. Oh, thank goodness you said that because <laughs> I, I never yeah. lose my cool. Totally always lose my cool. I um, have a 14 year old daughter. I'm enough not said. Her. Enough said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Like your your um, approach and your um your method and things like that all all of this fits so beautifully in with emotional intelligence because it's it's being aware of what's really going on and emotions come into that um but it's not just looking at the surface level you know we're not looking at the tip of the iceberg and and trying to stop or squash or prevent that unwanted behavior we're looking underneath at what's really going on like you said with the power and the control and um we're understanding a little bit more about our child's brain development and their nervous system and and the stuff that we know now that, yeah, our parents didn't know that it wasn't around, they didn't have access to it 20, 30, 40 years ago. So big shift. And I, I actually did, did I share, I remember before getting ready for this interview, I screenshotted a couple of your um, amazing posts. Thank you. Amazing posts. And I can't remember which one I, I was like, do I share the remote control one or do I share the digging down one? I don't know. I, I don't think I, I've shared the remote control one a while, a long time right. ago, probably last year. But can you talk about that with the, the concept of changing the sensory channel when your child I, is listening? Yeah. That's probably my favorite infographic because, and, and the way I drew it was I literally traced my cable remote <laughs> and then sent it off, sent it off to somebody who does a lot better jobs when, <laughs> to then, than I can with any sort of graphics. So, yeah. But um, so the, the greatest thing that I, I'm making this up as I go along to it being a parent, but I do come with a base knowledge of having this, this information of sensory processing in my back pocket and my wife also. So we're kind of like a step ahead of, of general yeah. parent, just because we know how sensory processing works. So what has since been validated in the literature is that when a, a kid is over-focused or shut down, their ears are broken. And your auditory sense 
is not exactly your strongest sense. And it's funny because in school, how much do we still, is it just a teacher standing in front of the class and telling information to kids? We all know as adults that we don't necessarily learn that way. We're, you know, we got to see it and feel it, do it and live it. And yet we still rely so much on our auditory system, which I've learned not to rely on. Um, but the, the story that goes along with that remote control, and again, this is a story, this is with my son, is he's playing a video game, he's watching TV, his, he has a different agenda, his attention is different, and I'm Italian, so when you say something and it doesn't work, you just say it louder. That's, <laughs> that's what Italians do. So, and eventually, you, you think that works, and then it does, so then you say louder, you get a little grumble in your voice, because now you're aggravated, and that fear may wake them up, or it may not, um, or you can just stop talking to them. So basically, I'm telling you to stop talking to your kids if it's not working, um, because their ears, it's not that they're, they're deaf or they are just, it's not getting in. They, their auditory processing is not their primary sense right now. So change the channel. So when we're talking about senses, and even if we just use the five senses that we all learned in school, don't use ears, hearing, use vision, use touch, use, you know, you can use, if you want to talk about movement, whatever you have to do to get the message in of what you want. So the bus is going to be here in three minutes. Get your shoes on. They're not listening. Get your shoes on. That's the auditory sense. If you change the sensory channel and hand him a shoe, mm -hmm. tactile, that's touch. If you're in front of his face, that's vision. Those are different sensory channels. He's going to have a better chance of putting his shoes on. Um, so it's, that's where you have to check yourself and just be like, okay, instead of doing the same thing over and over again and just getting louder and knowing that that's not working and getting myself dysregulated, mm -hmm. maybe I take the sensory cue from my child that this approach is not working. Let me try it a different way. And that's where changing the sensory channel comes in. It is really helpful. Um, so, so yeah, if you can change the channel, that's great. But I tell you what. The auditory sense is not the greatest sense in general. And when that kid is dropped down on the floor in the store or just completely shut down in your, your living room, they can't even hear you. No. Nope. Um, so the auditory sense is, is not your best way to go. Use a different, use a different channel, change the channel. Yep. I love that because you've got other options. We don't just have to raise our voice. And right. meanwhile, we get more and more peed off because we're not being listened to and that's being disrespectful. Like we make up those stories in our head, right? Yeah. So I always tell parents, get more creative and playful in your parenting. It's not just buses here, three minutes, hurry up, get a, like, get in front of their face or give them a little squeeze or a back rub or show that the shoe, like you said, you know, so many right. different ways, but we just get stuck in that one route. Right. <laughs> and you know what? If you show him the shoe and he still doesn't do it, Put the first shoe on them and then hand them the second one. It'll go on. By that time, you'll you'll get it on and you're going to make it to the bus. There's no guarantee you're going to make it to the – you may get mad and then have to drive to school and then you're going to be late for work. Like You can go down that spiral mm -hmm. or you can just change the sensory channel, get the shoes on, make it no big deal and have a great day at school. I know. And then everyone is a lot less stressed. <laughs> Right. You could actually start your day from a, a place of calm as opposed to already being triggered when you go into work. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have a tough day. Yeah. And just the ripple effects <laughs> to your colleagues. Yeah. Anyway, whatever. Yeah. Um, I, I love that. I think that's just such a such a simple yet powerful. It's almost like a bit of a hack, you know. Right. Right. Like that. Um, I saw something that you posted. I don't know when you posted it. It was probably not, uh, you know, a little while ago, but just as I was getting ready this morning and it was um, kids need to seek a reward. Kids need to seek reward through human connection, not a sticker, not a token and not an object. So yes. talk a bit about the, the importance of that human connection. The um, I know, you know, Mona talks, Mona Delahook, who we both love, talks a lot about co-regulating and having that connection from a nervous system point of view as well, why is that so important? And, and how is that more, in, more beneficial than giving them a reward or something we think they want? Right, so I, I, I heard that saying 
um, from two different people um, in, in two different points of my life, literally in two different states. One was New Mexico. And um, I don't know if that's a Bruce Perry quote or not. I forget. Yeah, I know, I know the, the meme that you're talking about. But, and, and I can't stress this enough. So we are teaching kids to do things for the thing, for the prize, for the, the, the extrinsic reward that the things make you feel good and make you feel better. We're teaching them from a very early age that that's how you feel good, by getting the thing. That turns into very bad behavior later on. That turns into all of you, I gotta get the thing, I gotta get the thing. And, and the people that I'm hearing this from is, this is where it turns into the drugs and the alcohol and the gambling. And, and you fast forward, our kids grow up and we were paving that path from a very early age to teach them that if I get the thing, it feels better. <laughs> now, the literature is, and when I say the literature, I mean, this is when you talk about um, uh, Dan Siegel's interpersonal neurobiology and, and polyvagal theory and, and all of these theories from, from different, um, different disciplines, they're all saying the same thing, that we are wired for connection. That And we all learned this through the pandemic when we couldn't see anybody anymore, that, that that hurt us to our core because as human beings, we rely on each other. Mona and I are in complete alignment with this where co-regulation is the most important thing. And I mean us co-regulating right now, co-regulating with our partners, our kids, our coworkers, like that's what we do. And that's the most important thing. So you're better off having another human being to co-regulate with than working for that prize or that $2 little trinket now. Um, so, and what ends up happening over time, and, and I'll tell you a story about this that happened, um, started in preschool and went to middle school. The prize has to get bigger because it's no longer satisfying. So I was working with a little boy as a preschooler. And, and this is one of the things, you know, 20 something years deep there. Are, I've worked with kids now who have gone through the full gamut. You know, I, I've known them as preschoolers during college now, which is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so I was working with a little, uh, 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 you know, three, four year old boy and they were doing food rewards. If you do this, you get the prize. And so behaviorally, he was always it was a very dysregulated kid in school, a lot of aggressive behaviors. So it was the rewards for not hitting for the, for, you know, keep quiet hands and all of those things. You get the thing. And did it work temporarily? Maybe in that moment for a brief second? Yes. Did it solve any problem? Not at all, because this is the only system that they used. Fast forward to middle school, his aggressive behaviors were, really problematic to the point where th there was a real safety risk now and the reward was now if he's not if he basically doesn't tear up his classroom he's working for an iphone so we went from food rewards to an iphone i, I just i can't i can't get there. it doesn't make sense to me anymore and the the three-year-old the people working with him as a three-year-old don't know that end result story. Mm -hmm. And so like the, the, the people at the, the, the polls there, they don't know the detriments of that. Yep. Um, and we have to start telling them yep. that this is a problem and, and we're, we're setting our kids up for failure and we're setting them up for, for potentially dangerous behavior. But again, the human connection, the stuff that we're wired for, well, that's, that's actually, it's free and, and it's easy and it's much more beneficial long-term. I mean, it's, it's a life skill. Um, so let's go there instead of working for the thing. That was a big soapbox and a lot of breath. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm just absorbing that. And you, 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 you sort of laid it out so beautifully. We need to, what we're doing now for our kids. There's a lot of parents watching here, but there are educators as well. 
um, what we're doing now with our kids or with our students is affecting them for years to come, right? We're shaping, we're kind of changing the trajectory is what I say by what we're doing now. So knowing, you know, emotional intelligence, knowing your child's nervous system and their sensory processing and, and what's going on under the surface, this gives us so much more information and, and we have the research. And like you said, the literature about it now, we know what works and we know what doesn't. We know what does, right. Yeah, and, and change, change is hard and it's what was done to us. So I almost feel like there's some sort of, I don't want to, I guess, revenge. I don't know. Like, well, this was done to me, so I have to do it to you. Um, <laughs> like we have to kind of get past that now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, that's where, that's where uh, I guess a lot of emotional intelligence stuff comes in with knowing how you feel about your child's emotions or behavior, knowing how you were parented, um, seeing that there are gaps or there are errors or, you know, um, things that did not help us and having the, um, the awareness, but the compassion with yourself. And, and then that, that movement to say, yeah, I want to be different. I don't want to treat my kids the same way, or I want to make changes in my family or in my classroom. Um, because now, now that we know better, we need to do better. Right. Mm. Absolutely. So is there, um, is there any, want another story? I was going to say, we, we had, we have time for another story. And I remember we talked a little bit about um, a, a particular little loving touch technique. Oh my God. Uh, did you want to uh, share something is, else? Yeah, this is my, this is my, <laughs> and this is not my technique. I will find the person who created this. So during, I learned this when my kids were babies and, and kept it in my back pocket. And I will find the person who, who wrote some sort of blog about this. Um, but, oh my gosh, it works. So, and this is again, me putting, rethinking and all the things that drive me nuts as a dad and kind of putting in my knowledge and my, the model, um, then the way I see parenting and, and kids behavior, what drives me nuts and it happens at work and it happens at home is when a kid has something to tell you, they're just going to tell you. They don't care if you're on the phone, <laughs> if you're in a conversation with another adult, they don't care what, if you're in a shower, if you're going to the bat, they don't care. They're going to tell you, they're going to tell you. So, and you know, we, we have, I know it streams in Australia. I don't know. We have family guy and the, the little cartoon guy named Stu. He goes, mom, mom, mom. Yeah. Yep. This is this to me. And when I hear it, it's like the seagulls in finding Nemo. <laughs> like mine, 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 dad, 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 dad. I, I get triggered going. So I needed to do something about this. So I think the old school way was to be like, stop it. Go over there. Leave me alone. When I'm done, I'll come and get you like something like that. Now I do. So I, I did this with my daughter first. Um, and the fun part about this is she still did this all the way through 12 years old. She was still doing it. And I taught her really young. Um, that when they need to tell us something, ask us something, instead of coming up and getting in our face, the only thing they have to do is just put their hand gently on my wrist. And then what I do is I put my hand on top of theirs very gently. That says to them, I know you're there. And as soon as I can break my conversation, I'm going to give you my undivided attention and you're going to tell me what you want. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we practice, we, we practice it and, and kids typically get it pretty quick. So, and, and I'll, I'll say it with them, um, I'll say, Here, go ahead, put your hand on my wrist. And they go like this, like, what do you need? <laughs> right. And they're like, Oh, like, they see, like, it's fun. It's funny. They're like, wow, that worked. So I do it, do it again, do it again, do it again. And they put their hand, I put my hand up. What do you need? And they're like, wow. So, so they get it. Right. So let's say I'm having a conversation with my friend and they come up and they interrupt and I'll just be like, and they put their hand on my wrist and I, and I say to my friend, excuse me one second. So I'm teaching them the social skills of how to stop a conversation. I put my hand on theirs. I say, what do you need? They tell me and whatever it is I address, I'd be like, mm, you know what? That sounds like a good idea. Go ahead. Or, mm, you know what? I heard you, but I have to think about it. So as soon as I've done here, I'll meet you over there in two minutes. I'll give them something. 
they're completely validated. They're heard. They got it out. They're gone. So for years, this was still happening that my son and my daughter would come up. They put their hand on my wrist and I would put my hand. It's so cute because it's this warm, soft touch. It's, it's literally physical connection. And then I would extend the time that they had to wait because so I'm, I'm teaching them that, okay, you know, I'm, I'm literally physically attached to my parent right now, but this is going to work. I know it's going to work. Mm. And so then we, we address it and we go back. When my daughter was 12, we were at like a, a family gathering and all the adults were sitting around drinking wine and the kids are running around. And my daughter came up and put her hands on my wrist as a 12 year old. And I put my hand on top and then I let it stay a little bit. I gave her a little wink. And then I said to my, um, to my friends, excuse me one second. I just, I just want to see what she needs. And then I said, what do you need? <laughs> and she went and, and went off and it was fine. And they were like, what was that? <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, that's like some wrist thing that I do. Um, and it's really cute. It really works. And, and I don't have to hear my, my, my dad, dad. Like, I don't have to hear that anymore. Um, so, you know, oh. just like the kid, Okay, so a uh, behaviorist would say, "Well, that's attention seeking." Well, yeah, they need something, and it's 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 a ta- I I use Mona's term; it's attachment seeking, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. But there's some teachable moments within that I can teach them about how to navigate multiple conversations with multiple people, and to wait and 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 have a little bit of delayed gratification, Oof. and all with just a simple little loving touch. I just did it last week with a little boy, um, ADHD. And I mean, zero to zoom in a millisecond. And I mean, ping ponging off the walls. Like his, his, he's always in zoom. I taught him the wrist thing and he got it instantly and taught it to the parents. And the parents are like, I can do this. And the kid's like, I know it works because you just showed me that it works. Mm -hmm. Um, and sent them off and you get the reports back and you're like, yeah, it actually works. So I've taught dozens and dozens of families and it's not mine and I will find the person, but it is wonderful. It is touch. It is connection. It is teachable moments. It is validating and, and you know, acknowledging that your child is there and they want to talk to you. And it, it just, it's one of my proudest moments as a parent. Mm. That silly little wrist technique is just legend to me. <laughs> <laughs> Not silly little. It's that's that is game changing. Game change. I gotta put it in the book that's taking me forever to write. I just I love it that much. <laughs> oh yes, please do. And hurry up and write, finish your book so we can all read it. I, I've got I I'm a, I'm a travel soccer dad. I I I am Every weekend I'm at a soccer tournament in some state in the United States. <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard to write a book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. I'm I'm most of the way through mine and I've had a big chunk off and I'm like, get back to it, but it's finding I'll buy it, but I want I want mine autographed. <laughs> <laughs> we'll swap. Ah! Okay, there you go. Oh, cool. So before you go, what is on the bottom of your shirt? I can see the world needs. Okay. I am so glad that you asked me this because oh. I just got this shirt today. Okay. So, and this is a giant plug to, uh, there's a, a mutual admiration with the neurodivergent teacher. Um, so I follow her on every social media platform. So this shirt says the world needs all kinds of minds. Yes. Um, <gasps> so when, when autistic artists make and design things i support the autistic community i collect shirts designed by autistic artists so i wore this proudly to work today thank you for 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 mentioning it um yes so i am i just a i want to be a loud voice and I want, I need them to share their experiences as much as possible because that's how we learn. And any way I can support that, I will, um, because how they experience the world, we have to understand that. Yeah, it does. Yeah, we do. hundred oh, percent. You remember? Sure. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I was staring at it a little bit before. I was like, make sure I've got to ask him by the end. Um, are there, but quickly before we go, do you want to reel off? I, I want to, um, I know people will want to follow you and your great okay. Tucci on 
um, Instagram and on Facebook, you're Greg Santucci dash occupational therapist. Yeah, comma occupational therapist. Comma occupational um, <laughs> we we laughed about this with the thing. It was like, okay, if you do Greg Santucci, you're going to see soccer goals and pictures of Logan the mini Labradoodle. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but Greg Santucci, occupational therapist. I started in July of 2020, so I'm not yet two years, and we're about to hit 50,000 followers. I'm <laughs> I'm I'm just humbled. Uh, uh, there is no there's no ego in this whatsoever. I am just here to fight for kids. Um, that milestone is crazy to me. And all it does is it's like, all right, I got to do more infographics. I got to do more writing. Like it just fires me up to talk about this more. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so Greg Santucci, occupational therapist on Facebook. If I remember, I go to Instagram. Sometimes I don't remember. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I think I have a Twitter handle. I don't, Twitter scares me. Me too. Um, yeah, yeah, I just... People, people who have opinions on Twitter, I, I don't know, the Twitter versus. <laughs> yeah, Facebook is where it's and, at. And the TikTok channel is coming soon. Oh, okay. Yes, and I will be a little bit more goofy on that. Um, Yay. It's uh, the, my, my handle, which I'm not divulging yet, is hilarious. Um <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we will, we've got to stay tuned for that because I'm not on TikTok, but I've got to be on to see, you know, short little snappy videos of yours and other people who is getting the word out there um, about how we can help and best support our kids. Yeah. And yeah, your infographics, like you guys, if you are watching along and you do not follow Greg, why? Um, but get on. Yeah. Come on on Facebook. He's going to hit 50,000 followers soon. And yeah. Um, that just blows my mind. That means people need to hear, people are wanting to hear what you have to say and the stuff you need to share. I, you know, I just, I just love it. And I just, I try to bring like a whole lot of authenticity and practicality to it. Um, I mean, people know that I haven't charged anybody a dime for anything. Um, like I, I am, I have a day job. I have a job with benefits and everything. And, and I am doing this out of passion there is coursework that's coming because everybody's bargaining me to do courses so i'm working on getting ceu so that the professionals can actually get credit for this because i know they need it for their license so I, i'm doing that but i that's the the money piece is not the motivation the message is the motivation um and i'm fortunate enough to have people like you and people like mona and people like ross green um fighting the same fight for our kids and supporting parents and supporting teachers um, who are amazing and doing the best that they can. And the more tools you have, the better, the better we do. Um, but I, I don't knock parents. I don't knock teachers. I just advocate for kids. And I appreciate all the work that you're doing to helping us get the message out. Yeah. I'm going to continue sharing, sharing, sharing all of your work, <laughs> everyone else's. Cause I just think we've, we've got to share it and get the word out. That is the one great thing about the internet getting, getting information to people in corners of the globe, um, getting into the hearts and the minds of parents and educators and making some changes and, and making that movement happen. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. And how cool is this? You're on Friday. I'm on Thursday. You're in the morning. I'm at night. And we're just sitting here, you know, <laughs> preaching. This yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in your future. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Greg. And um, thank you guys for watching along as well. I can see there's so many. Holy moly. I haven't actually, guys, I usually watch the, the comments. Greg, you're a legend. Um, I want that same t-shirt. Oh, that's my beautiful friend who's an OT. Um, oh my gosh. We're going to hop on and go and reply to some of these 50 plus comments because that's just blown up. So, <laughs> and we wanted to sort of, um, one up Mona's interview. <laughs> Maybe we did. <laughs> Sorry, Mona. We don't like we all look at the numbers. <laughs> we we love, we love, love, love Mona. And and yeah. her book, I don't have it here. I have her book on Audible. I'll I'll plug Mona anytime. <laughs> I have her book on Audible. I have her book so that I can highlight it. Um, you know, I was I'm like, okay, Beyond Behaviors was great. The, the brain body parenting, I'm like, oh, it's going to be a parenting book. It'll be, a, a, you know, a, a little bit less thick. It is absolutely delicious. <gasps> um, and there, there's a whole lot of stuff that parents can sink their teeth into. And for professionals who are just getting into this mindset, 
it's a, that book and Beyond Behaviors are a great star. Mona just hit it out of the park. She is an amazing human being. Ah, so good is. job getting her on. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, I was um, I was like, me. I won't happen. But yeah, we we haven't got her book yet. It's not quite out yet here. I've got her. Uh, yeah. I think her Beyond Behaviors is up there, but we're waiting a few more days. So, and then okay. I'll be posting left, right, and center about it. So, yay. <laughs> awesome. Yay. All right. Thanks, Greg. Have a great Thank rest you of your evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.